Hello, I'm Professor Richard Little, and I'm always amazed by the fact that geology shapes our lives in so many ways. Here in the Connecticut River Valley, everything from bricks to airports to agriculture is related to the rise and fall of Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Lake Hitchcock followed the melting glacier and eventually extended 200 miles from Rocky Hill, Connecticut to West Burke, Vermont. The dam is the key to any lake. You would think that some impressive big and strong structure must have held back all this Lake Hitchcock water. But no, the dam at Rocky Hill, Connecticut is a pile of gravel that was a deposit in an earlier glacial lake. You do not want to have water flowing over a dam, especially one of gravel. The key to Lake Hitchcock's 4,000 year existence is this, a strong spillway in bedrock. As Lake Hitchcock was beginning, the water level found a low spot several miles away from Rocky Hill in New Britain, Connecticut. And this became the spillway for Lake Hitchcock. And luckily, it was on solid, stable bedrock, so it could last for 4,000 years. Imagine standing alongside a colorful glacial lake, perhaps like in the Canadian Rockies, and seeing icebergs float by. Deltas are a major geological feature of Lake Hitchcock. They are important as landforms, gravel resources, and groundwater aquifers. Deltas have a very interesting structure. Inflowing streams deposit topset bed gravel, forming a flat top graded to the lake shore. Underwater sand and finer gravel, called forset beds, are deposited along the steep delta front. Mud, officially silt and clay, form bottom set beds that settle onto the deeper lake floor. Gravel pit excavating and natural river erosion give us views of these Lake Hitchcock deposits that are often obscured by vegetation or buildings. Airports love Lake Hitchcock delta tops. The land is flat, well-drained, and relatively rural compared to the flat land closer to the river. Delta gravel is an excellent base for airport runways. Look at these examples. They are all located on Hitchcock Delta Tops formed by the adjacent rivers. Next, there's a big mystery. The deltas are at vastly different elevations. This diagram is a bit complicated, but it reveals so much about Lake Hitchcock and what happened after the glacier melted. There are three things that are revealed here. First is the Connecticut 
river today with the dams along the river indicated. And then there's the estimate of where the lake bottom of Lake Hitchcock would be, what those elevations would be. And finally, there is this straight line that indicates the old shoreline elevation of Lake Hitchcock. Up in the north, we have elevations, delta elevations, that are over 700 feet. But down at the spillway in New Britain, Connecticut, the elevation is only about 70 feet above sea level. That gives a slope of the Lake Hitchcock shoreline, a slope of about 5 feet per mile. But of course, lake shores cannot be tilted, so something had to happen later. And to understand that, we need to go back and look at the thickness of the ice and what that does to the crust of the Earth. The solution to this mystery is that we have had post-glacial rebound. When you put a big weight on the Earth's crust, it will actually push the crust down by hundreds of feet in proportion to that weight. So, in the northern part of New England, where the glacier was thicker, the land was depressed to a greater amount. And when the ice melted back, we find that the crust will rebound in proportion to the amount that it was depressed. And so, when Lake Hitchcock was here, directly as the ice was melting, we had a stable lake level. But after a few thousand years, rebound occurred more to the north and to the south, and it tilted the water out of Lake Hitchcock. With the lake drained, the river came back to its valley, but it found things quite different. There were sediment deposits from the lake and the glacier that filled its old valley, and its former channel was hidden, so it had to make new pathways, and some of these are quite unexpected. Waterfalls were created because of this, and also there were some very strange river directions. When the Connecticut River came back to its valley, it initially meandered into Greenfield. The Deerfield River, for some reason, perhaps by rebounding land slope or just by chance, was angled north as Lake Hitchcock drained, and it became entrenched in this direction, opposite of the flow direction of the Connecticut River. As the Deerfield River headed north to join the Connecticut, it meandered and downcut through 150 feet of delta sediment, leaving numerous terraces like a series of giant steps, each with famously rich soil. After Lake Hitchcock drained, the Connecticut River just downstream from the French King Bridge cut through delta deposits of the Montague Plain. The river found itself on top of the Barton Cove Bedrock Peninsula. Held up by this bedrock, it created a series of waterfalls as documented by their plunge pools at Barton Cove. Along the Deerfield River upstream at Shelburne Falls, a similar event occurred. The Deerfield River could not find its buried pre-glacial channel. As it downcut through glacial and Hitchcock related sediment, it found itself on top of beautiful, nice bedrock. Stones swirled in cracks and drilled out potholes. Please note that potholes are due to lateral currents swirling stones like a drill bit. Plunge pools require gravity, waterfalls, and these are the eroded holes from the falling weight and volume of water. These are called glacial potholes, but they are definitely post-glacial. 
plus the potholes are river features, not glacier ice processes. Did you know that the potholes are still being formed? Any high river flow will cover these rocks with fast water. Since Lake Hitchcock drained 14,000 years ago, all these features can be dated back to this event. It's amazing, so much activity in just a geological minute. While in Shelburne Falls, don't miss the historic trolley bridge. Now, the Bridge of Flowers. There are so many treats in this scenic town. Waterfalls are so erosive that they are not common along most rivers. In the Connecticut River Valley, thanks to the stream disruptions caused by glacial and Lake Hitchcock deposits, there are quite a number of waterfalls. Waterfalls powered the historic industrial development of the Connecticut River Valley. Turnus Falls and Holyoke are excellent examples. Canals were constructed to distribute the water to rows of factories. Today, the falling water does not turn water wheels, but turbines. For hydropower. The legacy of Lake Hitchcock continues as a flow of electrons into homes and businesses. The Prey family made their namesake bricks in Greenfield up until the 1960s. Bricks were made in many Connecticut River Valley towns thanks to the silt and clay that settled on the floor of Lake Hitchcock. Glaciers are very effective rock grinders. Glacial rivers are notable for their muddy colors and the suspended fine sediment makes its way to lakes where it settles out on the lake floor. This is the raw material for the Connecticut Valley's historic brick industry. These humble lake bottom deposits record important information about the old lake. During the winter time, when the lake was frozen, very fine material could settle out onto the lake floor. And during spring and summer, when the lake was more active, silty sand could settle onto the lake floor. Each pair made one year. These are called varves, and they compose an important calendar for glacial lakes. These varves have been meticulously counted and correlated in the Lake Hitchcock area and 4,000 different varv years have been counted from the beginning in Connecticut to the end of the lake at its maximum extent in Vermont and New Hampshire. Sometimes floods and rainy years produce thicker summer varves much like how a tree ring records a wetter season. Lake Hitchcock drained gradually and in stages, not as a great flood. It was the gradual process of glacial rebound that uplifted the land which helped drain out the water. With the lake gone, the wind could blow across the dry lake floor and pile sand into dunes, sometimes a hundred feet high. And then there's river erosion. All the rivers that made deltas suddenly cut down through them as well as through the lake bottom mud as they developed new channels at lower elevations. Terraces were left as the flowing water meandered, as well as cut downwards. Sometimes rivers went in new directions, such as, for a time, the Connecticut flowed into Greenfield. The Deerfield flows north today. It should have angled south towards Mount Sugarloaf. The 4,000 years of Lake Hitchcock provided resources and scenery gravel and clay for building materials, deltas whose porosity absorb rainfall for groundwater aquifers, and terraces, flatland for towns and agriculture. 
The rise and fall of Lake Hitchcock has had an incredible effect on our landscape and our human history as well. This is one of the reasons why the Connecticut River Valley is the best place in the world to study geology. And I hope you agree.